I, I guess some hard questions maybe. Like, should we, yeah. Uh, what do you guys think of like, um, like I, I find it interesting that Tezos has like $500 in it, which is like a very fairly large number. Um, how do you deal, like, balance the fact that validators need, you know, to pay for the hardware, and the more validators you get, the less rewards you get per validator? I mean, sort of in, right, so, interesting, you could argue that this will eventually result in that most validators will have spent less on hardware, um, and sort of, maybe this is a design goal for these networks, right, you want to have people that like run validators on Raspberry Pis with a minimum stake available in their basement, and if everyone in the world does this, you actually end up with a pretty decentralized network that doesn't have a high hardware requirements though, and so maybe you can't scale as much. Um, for now, I think the hardware requirements between like Cosmos, Tezos, Iris, Polkadot, um, are all very comparable, um, and so like, all very low because like the actual transaction throughput that's happening on these networks um, sort of low for now. Um, in the long run, it may result that having fewer validators results in larger um, hardware expenses and maybe more powerful validators, but I think this will always come with the trade off of like what can a normal user run in terms of full nodes and can that actually validate the entire state if you sort of make validation nodes incredibly expensive to run. But do you see like pressure on the rewards when you do have so many? Like, is it the point that like you're running? Uh, a business that's sustainable, or you're a hobbyist that runs a node or you know, like in their house. So, interesting enough, I think for now, uh, the economics really haven't played out. It's way too early to tell. Uh, I think most people that are running valid, so like early, that got early on into the validator game, didn't really get in because they had like there were clear financial returns to be made. It was more like it'd be cool to run a bunch of servers out of the Swiss Alps in a tier four data center. That's like that's why I'm some physical service. Um, this may make this may break even at some point. In the long run, this is probably different, but I think for now, so if the economics is so far removed from the actual cost of running this infrastructure um, that like most people don't consider it too much. Um, yeah, I think it's a great and complicated question. Um, I mean, on some level, obviously, right, like Cosmos, for example, you know, we've had now recently a governance proposal to increase the value size from 100 to 125. And the, you do see that there are a lot of, you know, it, is it, it, it's probably profitable for very few parties on Cosmos. So, of course, it depends a lot on how much you invest in actually. You can, you can run, set up a value and just kind of run it, and then it's probably fine, uh, even for not huge validators. But what you have seen is that your smaller validators complain a lot, right? They're like, okay, this is horrible, it needs to be more decentralized, we need that. So, so you see that, and of course, if you increase it more, then you're probably going to get more of that. Um, I think the other question that's important is, you know, what is the expectation of validators? What should they actually do? You know, if they're going to do, if you're going to expect them to kind of to work on the blockchain and uh, contribute to it, then of course there should be some economic model connected to it. I think there, there is a, also a sort of other scenario that could play out, which is that you know maybe kind of contributing and doing work for a blockchain is a sort of tragedy of the common situation where uh, everybody likes if it's done, but nobody wants to pay for it. Um, and I think we're seeing some signs of that happening. Um, and so if, if you end up with that scenario, the most likely outcome to me seems to be that you will have the state concentrate with validators who have some other business model, right? There's some other way that they monetize this. Like an obvious way would be like an exchange could say, okay, we're gonna do zero, you know, zero fee validation, um, you know, just pool your assets with us and you can trade them, right? So that would be one way you could, you could have a business model uh, as well as doing zero fee evaluation. And maybe you can think of other ways to do a similar thing. So I, I think if you if there's if evaluation is not something that uh, is profitable or sustainable in itself, I think you're gonna bring a lot of these external economic factors into it. And no idea how that's gonna play out because we have no idea what these factors are. Uh, but of course the question is also how can you make it sustainable because it's not 
clear, um, you know, what, what models are. I mean, you could maybe have like minimum fees, but then you can kind of sort of circumvent that too. That's price fixing. Yeah. So, yeah. how the hell to write this? <laughs> so, so, do you well, think, do you think yeah. that Tesla's minimum, uh, the, the, the requirement to have um, validators with a minimum balance state, is that eventually going to get gamed? Well, I mean, you already have that validators then basically make contracts with, I mean, you've had some bakers write in Tezos where they say, like, hey, here's our riders, just like, I think you guys do that. Okay, but I think there are some that have basically done that, where like, okay, just send us your thesis, you know, and like, we use it as the security bond and we'll send you back, so that, you know, probably legally maybe we will see. Um, but but then others do it just with like legal contracts. So, so you have that already. There's a, like a lending market for thesis for security bonds. So does that help? I mean, if there's a lending market, it's going to favor those who may be best connected with VCs and who have the most like legal resources that have solid contracts. So I'm not really sure that does much for. So I'm not sold that this is a good idea. I mean, so in Tezos, this is so the minimum self bond requirement is more as it's a distributed system. You still have sort of global complexity, scaling complexity limits, and you, there needs to be some way to limit the valid data set, right? Um, so uh, in PBFT, traditionally, you do this sort of arbitrarily, you pick a number, and you say, well, 100, 125, 300, 1000 is probably a good number to do, and fix the valid data set. And sort of by introducing a minimum amount of stake, you just it's the same effect, uh, just a different mechanism to get there. Um, yeah. So, because the minimum yeah. bond doesn't have to do anything with self the expected rewards yeah. over that bond. Um, yeah. So, like, we're we're a pretty recent uh, entry into um, like we re uh, we launched our Tesla speaker like three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Um, like just from experience, I'm not a huge fan, of course, of the self bond requirement. Just because, um, like, anyways, the validators, um, our entire revenue depends on people staking with us, meaning people with a lot of tokens, meaning whales. So they control most of our revenue, anyways. But now, uh, because of the self bond, our growth, our ability to grow, is now also capped, meaning that they, the whales, now not only control the revenue we earn right now, but they also control the growth uh, of our business uh, on Tesla at least. So I'm not a huge fan of the self bond, and um, definitely feel like it should be reduced or at least um, taken away because um, it sounds good, right? Because you have your own stake at hand, and maybe people will trust you more. But the thing is, people uh, don't recognize that we have reputation at stake. Like we validate on multiple blockchains, meaning that if we uh, act maliciously or we screw up in one, that's going to flow over to other chains. They're going to see that, and then they're likely going to all withdraw from other chains as well. Switching costs are near zero, so. It's going to be very easy for people to just walk away from validators that actually, um, you know, screw up. Yeah. Like, um, so I think removing the security one from um, from any system is a bad idea because most likely this will end up like US, um, <laughs> right? Like, I, I fundamentally the same thing you said earlier. It's like I fundamentally believe that you need slashing, and I don't yet fully see how any system that doesn't have slashing. Is going to be secure, so in the medium to long term. Yeah. Um, interesting enough. So the the comparison between Cosmos and Tesla's here, the model is almost the same, except that um, there's an extra type of delegation in Tesla's that doesn't have to carry the slashing risk. This is the on-chain delegation, and that the delegation that carries slashing risk has to be performed off-chain right now. Um, but like the models are almost equivalent, except sort of at the point at which whether you that you take a security deposit when you sign a block instead of sort of uh, having all security deposits locked up front and then you just sign arbitrary blocks afterwards. Um, but so I think over time the models will actually converge to some extent. I think we'll see programmable staking happening in Tesla's and sort of like you can move the risk delegation into the protocol as well. And it will look very similar to how Cosmos staking works right now. But do you guys think that uh, more severe slashing will create a stronger set of validators because they will actually invest in like preventing that happen, or will it just cause like a black swan event? Like, so absolutely, we should definitely increase slashing percentages <laughs> across all networks. It's like a perfect idea, um, and like in Cosmos, it's like five percent, and Tesla's is also like five percent. 
Uh, it's like slightly hard to calculate. Um, but definitely, we should go up to like 20% easily. Um, the basic reasoning being that like right now, running a validator, it requires zero expertise. You run like one Google Cloud instance, um, and this mostly works. This is also a function of the fact that validation is like a super friendly business right now, where like everyone's like, cool, let's join all the Telegram groups, let's talk to each other about the networks we're validating, let's tell each other about like security setups. Uh, this is generally a good thing, but I would hope that, um, so I think these networks will start to falter as soon as we see the first real external actors trying to attack them. Um, because the validator sets fundamentally right now, there may be 20 to 30 validators worldwide right now that are sort of at a level of preparedness to actually handle a hostile environment. Most validators are running on like a single Google Cloud instance will just go down once the first real attacks start to happen. And I think by increasing slashing right now, we can sort of shift the balance towards actually having incentivizing people to run secure validators even right now. So, um, I'm actually really interested in this talk because uh, right now we're also working on our uh, economic paper. It's mostly done, but uh, since there's no um, uh, proven model yet, uh, yeah, there, there's still things to to settle. So uh, I'm just going to present just briefly how we thought of doing it. Uh, for us, it's uh, actually each everyone can participate. Uh, if they have the stake amount, so you could uh, actually enter. You don't need to be among a certain specific group to be delegated or uh, in order to validate or propose blocks. Uh, so as soon as you have the minimum stake and you stake it, then you you get uh, a certain chance of proposing or validating blocks. This is easily uh, calculable. Uh, so it, every amount of stake, it's uh, because it's working on fixed stake. Uh, every amount of stake has uh, around 36 possibilities during one day of being selected as a block proposer and 2,000 something chances of uh, being selected as a validator. So, um, in in uh, in uh, for for the work that you do, you also get uh, rewards and the fees. Uh, but uh, what I was interested in asking you guys was. Do you think that slashing is uh, useful also for uh, an inactivity rather than bad behavior? Because currently we are modeling just uh, um, slashing for uh, proven bad behavior, like you have a uh, uh, wrong state which you commit to or uh, things like this which you can prove. But uh, for unavailability, we just uh, think of decreasing a rating which actually just influences your chances of getting uh, selected more. Sure. Uh, um, uh, well, I think whether you want to punish for downtime probably depends a lot on how your consensus algorithm works and like, is it a problem? Like in something like Tendermint, it's obviously a problem because if you fall the two-thirds threshold, then the network would hold. So right now, there's very little punishment in Tendermint. Cosmos for, for that happening, so I think that should definitely increase. Uh, you know, if, if consensus model works in a very different way, then maybe it doesn't matter, maybe you don't care so much. I think regarding the slashing for double signing, I think you could sort of look at it in two ways. You could either look at it for, like, if you double sign, how much of a risk does it directly pose for the network? And let's say some small, tiny like we've had that in Cosmos, some small tiny validated double sign. It you know it doesn't actually threaten Cosmos at all. Um, so you could argue that okay, maybe there should just be a tiny amount of slashing. And then there's this concept of correlated slashing that like if, if you have a lot of stake double signing at the same time, then it, the punishment goes up. So I think that's kind of a reasonable idea. Also because if you have you know let's say there are some some of these providers that do a kind of a, like a white label validator type thing. Uh, for example, there's a company called Bison Trail that does that. So let's say they make it like very convenient for anybody to sort of spin up a validator. It looks like a network is decentralized, but actually like tons of validators might be run on the same infrastructure. Uh, so that seems like a risk for a network, right? So then at least if you have correlated slashing, if you know, let's say a company like that messes up, you could potentially have many of their validators at the same time, 
and then at least they would get you know very severely punished. So I think that is a good idea from that perspective as well. Um, you know, at the same time, I think Adrian's point is fair too. Right? If you have a high uh, penalty, then it does force people to you know really make sure that they save and invest in security. Although at the same time, I think you have in Cosmos definitely very large outages coming um, today. You know, that have very amateur setups and you know probably people don't really around it. people don't care when it goes wrong, but before it goes wrong, it just sort of um, you know won't too much. Like on the point of correlates, I think as an industry we need to move towards correlates actually because everything else makes it very little sense. Um, on lifeness and safety. Um, so lifeness should definitely be punished less depending on the infrastructure, like the consensus you're running. But generally speaking, if like one guy with one percent of the network goes offline for a week, no one cares. It's like this is fine. Uh, if the same thing if like one guy with one percent double signs, also no one cares. If thirty percent double sign, they should probably not be slashed five percent each. They should probably be slashed like fifty percent each because that's that's like a real risk to the network. Um, and so like sort of where, depending on where you set your safety thresholds, um, you may even want to do almost a hundred percent slashing. If let's say 50% equivocate at the same time, maybe not as an attack, but you probably want to remove all of them from the other set immediately. Because this is a sort of a game, you know, World War type scenario for that network. Because at that point, most safety guarantees come off. Yeah. Uh, I guess culturally, it seems like validators are like a friendly bunch. Folks, <laughs> compared, <laughs> compared to people that uh, like you know hardcore miners, just because the slashing rate is pretty low. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you think it'll change? Like, do do you guys see that like we're gonna see like adversarial attacks between validators? Um, yeah, definitely, one hundred percent. I think um, eventually um, we'll see more competition um, because. Uh, you know, as exchanges enter in, as wallets enter in, as the pie grows smaller for like just pure validator, I think um, the market will be competing for might um, decrease a bit, uh, and so you'll have more competition to try to win over funds, to try to win private like big whale holders. Um, and yeah, on to the slashing point, like you know, as slashing rates increase, like uh, you know, you're less likely to share your security setup because you know you're worried that any sort of slip up uh, could be an ad attack advantage that another validator takes um, advantage of and you know, launches an anonymous attack on, uh, on a validator to bring it down. Like, I, I truly believe it's it's a risk that will happen um, as these proof of stake launches like, grow to millions of dollars and get a lot of money on the line. It's an interesting question, right? Um, will, other, will validators attack other validators? I think it depends. Uh, so it may be less likely that within the same network, validators attack each other because they sort of have relatively decently aligned economic incentives in like not trying to um, sort of make it look like the network has security flaws. Um, but I can certainly see how groups of validators will form around specific networks and start targeting every network that isn't part of that group um, because so. Sort of you want to prove that the other proof of stake system is shit. And <laughs> exploit it, right? Uh, so I can, that's like one potential feature that I can see happening. Uh, the other one is, uh, it depends where you put your economics. Solana, what are you going to start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, racketeer mix. It's going to be interesting. Um, but I think another sort of thing here is, it depends where you put your economic incentives. So in Tezos, if uh, I find an equivocation, and I submit the equivocation, I get half of the burn deposits. Uh, so I, as a validator, have a strong incentive to not share equivocations because I can literally use it as an extra revenue driver. So if I can just go up with a bunch of vulnerabilities, I could potentially get a bunch of people slashed and then equivocate them and make a bunch of money. Uh, in systems such as Cosmos, this may not apply as much because rewards are shared between validators. Um, I'm not sure which one is the better model. Um, I do, well, so I personally prefer the model where it's shared because uh, it sort of like forces validators to harden the network and try to attack it themselves, like and try to infight between themselves. Um, yeah. I mean that that's kind of quite different from mining, right? Like typically, like mining almost like the idea of selfish mining came from Bitcoin, right? That you would try to 
we would rather like generate blocks than somebody else, even if the security of the network is lower. But selfish mining, I mean, I don't think there's evidence that was like widely used on Bitcoin. No, no was like yeah, it's very hard to tell retroactively. Yeah, yeah, sure. But you do have selfish mining attacks, um, or like similar sort of attacks uh, in proof of stake anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, where either I can try to eclipse you from the network messages and you sort of drop out of consensus and you use mistake that way, and then I the pre commits, and that way uh, I may lose some small reward, but I may be punishing you more so my inflation goes my way. I think we haven't explored enough the attacks because of the mistake yet. It's going to be fun. Yeah, I mean, like, so slashing for um, liveness, right? So for slashing for unavailability, that's like an obvious attack. Yeah, although I guess if, if you, I mean, if you look at like so many of these blockchain networks that, you know, people say or like it seems like they're very poorly designed and have all these weaknesses and then even if they have maybe very, very high market caps, it doesn't seem like there are a lot of people systematically attacking that. And there should obviously be money in that, right? Because you could short. So my, my theory is that everyone that can create the attack is working on a project right now. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, there's more money in that, so. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as they can short these chains easily, then we might see more. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I guess that's a great argument for uh, actual markets where you can go short. Well, if the majority of the network is stable, how do you short the capital of the liquidity? Well, that depends. Um, for example, if exchanges get into this game and start offering yep. uh, derivative trading over staked assets, um, you start running massive counterparty risk if you on those exchanges start shorting the assets they're attacking at the same time. But if you, as soon as that has enough of a market, you can potentially do this. All, like genuine derivatives will make shorting these things easier because it will provide way more liquidity over staked assets. Um, and by the way, people keep saying that like creating derivatives over staked assets is a bad idea. You shouldn't put this in protocol. I think we have to because otherwise the exchanges will all do this. And there will be a huge economic incentive for tokenos to move all their coins to exchange because they get perfectly put into an exchange. And it's this like a product that if you don't build this into the protocol, um, independent validators will be able to offer it and will hugely suffer to this. But it's, it's just that it's such a ways out, right? Uh, in order to create these. I mean, like, how would you price these things? You know, like, how would you price the risk? There's um, still so much standardization that needs to happen, a lot of assessment that needs to happen on validators, not only validators, but also cross proof of state systems in order to create these at scale. I mean, I mean, we, we just sort of designed the system for doing that in Cosmos and built in the Berlin Hackathon, so um, I don't think it's far out at all. I think it will happen this year. Um, now, in terms of pricing it, I mean, there's a market, markets, that's a problem with markets, but it's not a problem with the protocol. Uh, so I don't, I don't see that as an issue. So I think from a technical perspective, we'll definitely see this this year. This is like not difficult to do. I think from the liquidity side on the market, this may be different because, right, like we run two different independent validators, our derivatives aren't necessarily fungible. So if an exchange start listing, starts listing this, like in each individual trading pay have very low liquidity. Um, the other thing is, can exchanges list derivatives and do they want to because the start to compete with them? So we may have to wait for DEXs to be able to like efficiently list these kind of derivatives. I think the other interesting thing about these derivatives is though, that um, let's say you and me, we have, like with our validators, we create these derivatives and we go, well, we've audited each other's setups and we sort of are fine with uh, how secure you are and how secure I am. Um, and so we issue the same derivatives, um, and all of a sudden we're increasing the liquidity or the availability of the um, derivative, and even sort of giving people that hold the derivative more of a security here because of an assurance. Because um, if any one of us gets smashed, both parties cover for the fault. And so you could see that groups of validators that trust each other emerge as sort of people that pool. Um, their derivatives to insure themselves 
Um, and that may actually create a very liquid market for these assets. Do you fear that this is going to be the next kind of default swap? Oh, that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th I think if you look at credit default swaps, like what, what is the big difference? Well, I can. I mean, I think the big issue around credit default swap right, was the lack of transparency in the industry. So you had all these crappy kind of mortgages that came in, and then the other end people bought it with uh, you know, all these structured products. So without there being like a transparent supply chain of like what they were actually buying, and so you have these rating agencies in the middle who just said like AAA, uh, and then the other the other end they just bought it. And so I think that that was in a way one of the big problems. Uh, that you had in the financial crisis. So I think the beautiful thing about blockchain is that it will all be transparent, right? And you'll see what is being created, how. Uh, I mean, once you add like zero knowledge, who knows? But, there's, there's so many designs and variations and implementation differences. Like, I, I don't know, right? Like, but there will be an incentive for, I mean, the data will be there and anybody will kind of be able to analyze it and, and take action on it. If, you, if it is mispriced, there's an opportunity, right? And then, of course, the other thing is there's no Fed or there's no quantitative easing or that kind of stuff. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there may be, I guess. But <laughs> Until there's a sovereign state. At, at least you can opt out. At least you can say, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to participate in this chain if you know if it does those kind of things and it all goes but belly up, right? If, whereas in the, you know, the US dollar, can opt out so easily. Uh, with enough time, yes. Because, you know, uh, like, for example, like, we assume, like, MakerDAO is, you know, taking up what, a huge supply, a uh, percentage of the term supply. We assume that smart contracts, everything is safe, but who knows, you know, we, of course we could, we could all audit it and we could all see it, but, you know, there's still that possibility that suddenly it just, Locks and you know, so there was a bug in the Xerox contract. Yeah, so like you know, these things happen after it, even after it's audited. So I think um, right now there's not enough money in it for you know people to attack it. And um, no, we haven't started packaging these stuff. You know, we haven't been derivatizing the derivatives yet. You know, uh, but once these things happen, I think which will eventually happen. Um, I think then it just takes one bug, one sudden you know sudden uh, lock. And we see people panicking. Um, it's it's possible. On that note, do you guys do you guys have questions? Yeah. yeah. What's the best practice <coughs> on your infrastructure as a service provider or enterprise value? Yeah, the, the question is what what what's the best practice on running uh, enterprise validator or big validator or this chain, and what do you use? What what services or uh, what setups? Maybe you can give, give us a brief overview. Yeah, I mean, so keep in mind that it's trade-offs. So there is no right answer. Um, people can make different trade-offs for different reasons, and I think as long as you can sort of argue for your trade-offs. Uh, and you sort of convince the world that this is reasonably safe, this is okay. Um, so there is no real right answer here. I can tell you sort of what um, we've taken as the trade-offs. Um, so we clearly have the trade-off of safety over lifeness. Um, we do not, so in terms of our infrastructure, we do not duplicate signing keys ever. Um, and there are only live in hardware security modules that track the last date that we signed uh, under the assumption that even if all our servers get compromised, uh, you can't convince the HSMs without hacking into the HSMs themselves to actually commit a safety fault. Of course, this may mean um, we had different restrictions to do this. So we could be based in San Francisco with our servers because we had to roar with earthquakes. This is one of the reasons we picked Switzerland. It's like geographically an extremely safe jurisdiction and location. Um, where I don't have to wear, so I'm sort of okay not having this with the geographic redundancy. Um, and yeah, it just forces we also can't do sort of this hot failover that other people rely on, so it puts some restrictions around uptime there. Because, right, like, uh, it can always happen that a server runs out. Um, and in that case, we do manual failover um, to switch the infrastructure. To us, this was a worthwhile trade off because we cared very deeply about never being slack. Um, and you can sort of engineer other infrastructures around minimizing the slashing risk, but I think. 
um, by duplicating and signing keys, you always somewhat move along the spectrum. Um, besides that, it's not like basic infrastructure. You want to have a bunch of physical servers, uh, redundant fiber connectivity to like one cloud provider or two cloud providers, some, inter some local ISP as well, so you have redundancy there if Google Cloud goes down, which happened. Um, I just do these kind of things, and at that point, just stand and have a Yeah, I mean, there's of course countless things there, but uh, we wrote like a about 20 page paper on the architecture, so if you're just in that, just go to a blog and then you'll find the link to it. So uh, our head of infrastructure, Chris, is uh, right here. Uh, you can talk to him, but he'll give you the same answer as I do, which is uh, uh, the thing about security is that the most insecure part of it is actually talking about the setup itself. Uh, so I'm sort of, I'm a business person and I want to market our security setup, but I'm sort of bad for doing so. Uh, but feel free to ask him some questions. I'm not sure maybe if he's in a good mood, he'll tell you something. <laughs> but yes, we do have a very metal when we make use of cloud services, you know, that kind of thing. Do you use computers? Oh, um, do we use computers? It's <laughs> a thousand people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'd be surprised. <laughs> I'm more, more worried about cloud setups. Just to be just from my engineering perspective, I'd rather see folks running stuff at home or, or in a co-location spot, but versus what we're Google powering about us. Interesting on the implies. Um, I think if you have a bunch of people that don't spend enough time on their physical infrastructure, they're running their own data center, it is very likely to go down in configuration mistakes. And like because like Google Cloud does take away a lot of the sort of uh, like electrical engineering aspects. Um, of running servers. And so this may be depends. So speaking of um, validating security, I would argue that the market for validating security right now is really inefficient. I think there are probably two primary reasons. One reason is that there's a huge asymmetry of information between validators and delegators. Uh, delegators often don't know what the validators are doing, and even in the occasional cases when they do, because the validators publish some information. They have no way to verify it. Usually, they don't have the credentials or it's not worth the time to evaluate it. Uh, so, while it's laudable that the validators are publishing security setups, I don't think that's making the market all that much more efficient. The other serious uh, challenge is that the uh, that slashing is quite discontinuous. It's not the case that you are like somewhat less likely to be slashed if you have a somewhat more secure validator setup. Either you get slashed or you don't. It's binary. And whether that happens or not, since we haven't seen it so much very far, it's super hard to predict. So a lot of our choices are speculative. Uh, are there ways we can improve upon either of those dimensions that we help with this? What are the other? I mean, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's a huge problem, and it's extremely hard to evaluate like the security setups. And yeah, I think it's I mean it's really hard to see efficient markets emerge there. Um, uh, yeah, I don't really have an answer. I mean, maybe just increasing the slashing penalty so that people feel like, you know, I, I, this, I fear this event so much that I'm going to like invest and, and try to get, uh, you know, some more predictability on that might be an idea. But it's, yeah, it is, it is, a, it is a challenge. And, and of course, also the thing is, if you, you know, let's say you just uh, punish for like downtime slashing. That's not necessarily a very good predictor of the quality of the setup either. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it's still too early, right? I think with enough data points, you'll have enough uh, history to actually look through and uh, determine how healthy uh, a validator was. Um, I've also thought a little bit about like maybe insurance markets on validators. Um, of course, this might be priced on reputation more than the security setup, but maybe potentially that's a way of sort of uh, crowdsourcing everyone's knowledge and their interactions with a validator and sort of price, market price, how risky a validator is. Um, but this is, again, highly theoretical. This isn't an answer, though, just a uh, random thought. Um, if we had a lot of micro-slashing events, like slashing would happen very frequently with small amounts, and it didn't kill validators, we would generate tons of data to see um, sort of what the security implications are of this, like how validators are actually behaving. Um, maybe we should do this in the, on the real networks, but we maybe should have a test net, like 
global testaments that sort of heavily incentivize micro slashing, that many slashing events to happen. Um, like even where like my valid tries to, I try to attack my own infrastructure to see this, um, just to um, sort of gather more data points about the pulse of action and how efficiency will behave in the real world. So much of the, the critical piece is around like how do you store the keys? You know, so like I can write a slashing rule that detects that you're you know starting with a plain text file and you're you know <laughs> in, in like a HTTP cert folder, right? That anyone can see. <laughs> That's true. Okay. So we should probably wrap up. Yeah, someone has one last question. 